Greetings to you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm grateful to be with you. As we prepare to hear from God's word in scripture, let's pray together. Father, may your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and the glory of Christ our single concern. Amen. Our scripture today is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And at various points in the message, I'll be referring to surrounding passages, but our central focus are these four verses. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the thing above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Thanks be to God for his word. You have been raised with Christ. You died and your life is now hidden. When Christ, who is your life, appears. These are astonishing words. Perhaps they become familiar to us, but when we take a close look, they are amazing and puzzling. How many people woke up this morning before your morning cup of coffee and felt like you had been raised with Christ? And what could it mean that we have died? Yes, you may have heard sermons before on dying with Christ. And it's likely that you've heard the admonition, die to the self, die to the old self. In fact, I've heard more than a few sermons where the punchline is basically this, try harder to die to the self. Try harder. Try harder. But here Paul says, you've already died. What's going on? Why does Paul say that our life, or the one who is our life, will appear? I mean, hasn't our life already appeared in the life that we're now living? Well, thankfully, at least one part of this passage is pretty easy to interpret. Set your, set your hearts on the things above. As Americans, we all know about that. Don't think about negative things, but think about positive things. As New York City minister Norman Vincent Peale said in his many-time bestseller, The Power of Positive Thinking, our happiness depends on the habit of mind we cultivate. So we set our mind and our heart on what is above. Peale says, formulate and stamp indelibly in your mind a mental picture of yourself succeeding. Hold this picture tenuously. Never permit it to fade. Your mind will seek to develop the picture. Do not build up obstacles in your imagination. Set our minds on the positive. Cling to it and you will succeed. Have confidence in yourself. Peel's words have become such a part of the spirit of our age that it's hard to recognize him as saying anything distinct at all. He says, believe in yourself. Have faith in your abilities. Without a humble but reasonable confidence in your own powers, you cannot be succeed or be happy. But with sound self-confidence, you can succeed, he reassures us. A sense of inferiority and inadequacy interferes with the attainments of your hopes. But self-confidence leads to self-realization and successful achievement. Now that's what Paul is talking about, right? In setting your hearts on the things that are from above. Well, as I think about it, I don't remember that part about success um, in Paul's passage. Maybe that's not quite what's going on either. 
So let's hear these peculiar words again and try to move beyond our mishearing. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Just to get a sense of how remarkable these words are, and how they are quite different from the admonition to try harder to die to the self, or try harder to imagine success. Let's see how this passage fits as a pivot point in between Colossians 2 and Colossians 3. In Colossians 2, starting with verse 6, Paul says that just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, overflowing with thankfulness. He he then goes on to speak about living this life in union with him and the ways in which we have died in baptism and have risen with him. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head of every power and authority. In him you were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh, but was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the death, dead. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us our sins having canceled the charge against our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, having disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in the cross. Sometimes we want to just skip to the resurrection. We want to be raised with Christ, but we don't want to die to the old self. We don't want to die to the flesh. John Foreman, who's the lead senior of Switchfoot, has a new set of albums that explores the notion of dying and rising with Christ. In one song called My Coffin, he says, Resurrection comes, but death comes first. All of our entitlements and rights will drive the hearse. I'm bleeding death. Death is unmade. The minute I lose myself, I'm saved from my coffin. Your whole self was ruled by the flesh, Paul says. But it was put off when you were circumcised with Christ, when you were buried in Christ. Just as our passage today says... You have died. But then resurrection comes. God made you alive in Christ. And your life is hidden with God in Christ. As Christians seeking to do ministry in God's world, I think this should be both reassuring and unsettling. I recall growing up as I was seeking to find my calling in life, um, taking spiritual gifts into inventories, many of which were kind of like personality type um, tests, and everyone in the congregation would um, take those, and it was involved a lot of introspection, and sometimes, you know, looking at some ways in which you were affirmed in various ways. And the goal of this was to come up with a vision of how you were to be active in the world and um, how you were to be um, 
participating in God's work in the world. But the goal, the, the way in which this was done is quite different from what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that to find life, you look outside yourself, that you have died and your life is hidden in Christ. This death is something that we can't pull off ourselves. <laughs> it's something that is accomplished. It is the um, indicative. <laughs> it is our true identity in Christ that we have died. And yet this is a death that um, Paul goes on to say that we need to put on as well. As he goes on in chapter 3, um, Paul says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, and starts listing out um, those sinful ways that belong to the earthly nature. And as part of that, he says, do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with his practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the image of its creator. Now this can be kind of confusing because death is one of those things, it's a little bit like pregnancy. You either are pregnant or you aren't. There's no middle ground. But Paul has just said that you are dead, but you are to put to death the path of the old, of, of the old self. What is going on here? Well, while Paul has these exhortations to live in a Christ-like way in chapter 3, he doesn't ground them, as some of the sermons that I heard, in the idea of try harder. He grounds them with the gift of who we are in Christ. And who we are in Christ is that we are united to Christ in both his death and resurrection. This is good news, my friends. Sometimes we think that the dying to self part is our own part, and then you know, God will come along and give us the resurrection part, perhaps um, as an aspect of the revivalistic tradition that um, bears so much influence upon American Christianity. We sometimes think, you know, okay, I get right with God, I repent, and then the Holy Spirit will come into my life. Paul's whole image here is that you are dead <laughs> and you didn't do it. <laughs> God helped to make you dead in the old self, in the self that you were not created to be, the self that is alienated from God, so that you can die to that self and live in Christ, who is life itself. And so when we think about our calling in the world, we first have to think about our identity. And I think there's value to looking at our own gifts and um, maybe some value to those spiritual inventory um, gifts that I was given. But let's not forget that the central drama is Jesus Christ and our life in him. And Jesus Christ often likes to work um, through our weakness rather than even through our strengths. Now, when we come to the verses in our passage about set your heart on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, we certainly think of the ascension of Jesus Christ, the, his resurrection and glory. But there's also a reference here to um, Psalm 110, which was a favorite psalm of New Testament writers in referring to Jesus Christ. 
I think it might have been a favorite psalm because it's one of the few psalms that talks about both kingship and priests. Those tended to be fairly distinct categories. But in, in Psalm 110, sitting at the right hand um, of God was this kingly, royal image. And we also have the same psalm, um, priestly images. Um, and Jesus Christ is the king and priest in this powerful way. Peter O'Brien, commenting on this passage, says that this, this phrase alludes to Psalm 110, seated at the right hand of, the, of, of God, points to the centrality and supremacy of Christ in the heavenly realm. Or to put it another way, the apostle alludes to the psalm in order to describe the one with whom they have been raised. Since he is in a position of supreme authority, no principality or power can prevent their access to this realm and to God's presence. Thus, they are to keep on aiming at what is above and him who is center. So the emphasis is aiming to the centrality of Jesus Christ, the King, the glorified one, the one that no principality or power can call into question his kingship. In September of 2012, I got this card from a girl in my congregation. A few weeks before I got this card, I'd been diagnosed with incurable cancer. And I had gotten a lot of cards. We were reeling. Cancer, incurable, terminal. My wife and I and our kids were too young to understand. One and three. I had already received a number of cards and it's one of those times where people don't know what to say. And so, as a person in the midst of it, you just seek to give grace when people say things. And sometimes people would say things and say, sorry for saying such dumb things. And you say, that's okay. But this girl in our congregation, who's um, 15 years old and has Down syndrome, loves to create things for people. So she made this very colorful card, and it says, get well soon, Jesus loves you, God is bigger than cancer. God is bigger than cancer. Even though it doesn't look like it, God is king. Even though it doesn't look like it, it doesn't appear this way. Jesus Christ is Lord. God is bigger. She didn't say, God will immediately heal you of this cancer. She didn't say, well, you know, it's actually not going to be that big of a deal. She didn't say, you're going to be a hero who heroically fights the cancer and, you know, inspires many other people by your heroic fight. She pointed to the center of the drama, which is not me, but God. That God is bigger than cancer. That there is no principality or power or cancer or sin or death that can have the final word against God. As followers of Christ, we serve the King and we bear witness to the King who is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ is the King, even when things don't make sense. 
it's really not helpful for us to try to make sense of it sometimes. When something happens in the life of a loved one and it just seems senseless, sometimes we're tempted to come along and say, well, I think this is actually what God had in mind here. Job's friends started out really well, actually. They went with Job after his afflictions came, and they just sat with him. And then it kind of went downhill. But Job's friends come up with all sorts of quite brilliant theological reasons and biblical reasons for why this would be happening. And I don't doubt that God does have reasons. But Paul reminds us here that we don't know the reasons. That our true life does not appear right now. Our lives right now are hidden until the appearance of Jesus Christ. And so in the meantime, we are to bear witness to the one who is life, even when things don't really make sense. Now this place of being in Christ, who has ascended and is seated at the right hand of God, is a privileged place to be. In a sense, we are kings and queens. We are priests and prophets because we belong to the one who is the king who is sitting there, the one who is the prophet, as Psalm 110 um, um, confesses and has the book of Hebrews gives us so much detail about. In the Heidelberg Catechism, which is one of the um, confessions of the church to which I belong, a Reformation Catechism, It has a question and answer about what does it mean to call Christ the anointed one, the one who is anointed by the Holy Spirit. And it gives, I think, a quite good answer, which is that um, Christ has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed by the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals the secret, secret will of God for our deliverance our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body. And continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal king who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. Christ has done this. It is accomplished. It is finished. It is who Christ is. But how do we access this? I mean, this happened 2,000 years ago, right? How do we access this? Well, we access this through being a member of Jesus Christ. (laughs) Through our union with him by the Spirit. The next question answer asks, why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ and share in his anointing. And then the catechism goes on and has things that are parallel to Christ as prophet, priest, and king. I'm anointed to confess his name, to present myself as a living sacrifice of thanks. So, prophet. To strive with a good conscience against the sin and devil in this life. King. And afterwards to reign with, afterwards to reign with Christ over all eternity. But notice the ways in which this prophet, priest, and king doesn't quite, it's not quite parallel. We are not the central actors. We belong to the central actors, namely Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. We do not go out and defeat violence and evil and Satan by ourselves. (laughs) We do not defeat sin and the devil in this life. Jesus Christ does We're the one who belongs to Jesus Christ. We are called to live in 
to this identity. Just as we are adopted sons and daughters of God, that is legal. All the papers are filled out. It's accomplished. It's finished. And yet, we are called to live into this identity as children of the king. Children of the king. And so when we think about our calling for ministry and our life in ministry, it's not that we are the heroes. We are not central to the drama, but we belong to the central actors. And we can give thanks to God for that. Because as we do ministry, whether it is in military communities, whether it is in a homeless shelter, whether it is in a congregation, If we go to others and act as if we are the saviors, it will lead to resentment and burnout. But if we go as servants of Jesus Christ, ones who belong to the one who is king, we can bear witness to Christ even if we can't fix all the problems that we see. Even if some of what we encounter still seems senseless. And that is some of why it is so central to understand what it means to belong, to be hidden with Christ in God. God is bigger than cancer. God is bigger than violence and unbelief. But not all of our victories will be visible right now. When I was in college, I took a friend named Phil to Urbana, a missions conference with InterVarsity Fellowship, which actually used to be held in a place called Urbana. I had a love for both international missions and uh, missions in the United States, and it was just a great time. I was at Wheaton College, and he was a senior in high school, A great time of laughter, late night conversations, sharing that time with Phil. And it was influential for Phil in actually developing a heart for international um, missions. He went to Moody Bible Institute after that. And then after that, Phil came here and sat in the very seats that you are sitting in. He graduated from Trinity and through a series of experiences and friendships, he felt the full-time or the call to full-time missionary service to be a Christian witness among Muslims in a Southeast Asian country. He was married to a woman who felt the same call, and they raised support together. We helped support him. I helped support him. They went to South A- Southeast Asia, and in the first year or so when they were there, they loved it. God was working in surprising ways, in amazing ways. They had a baby, a little girl. And Phil was in the process of writing a whole year of devotionals for his little daughter to read when she was older. When he contracted dengue fever and to the surprise of the doctors, He died after a few days. That's not how this story is supposed to end. How senseless. What was God thinking? God had called them. God had been active. God had given them this beautiful young daughter. This was not the visible victory that they had planned on or that any of us had desired. The calamities of God's people often seem senseless. From Job to Jephthah's daughter to Hagar, their paths of suffering don't make sense to us. The good news of being with Christ in God is not that we visibly succeed through positive thinking. Indeed, until Christ's kingdom comes in fullness, many of our victories will not be visible ones. 
We spread the good news of the kingdom of God like a tiny mustard seed that we can't even see. And when we wait upon God's promises, even when we wait in the dark and we don't see fruit. As we wait upon God's promises, we also finish for God rather than ourselves to finish the story. A quick death in Southeast Asia was not the end of the story for my friend Phil. Our own calamities, our own failures, even our own sin is not the end of the story for us either. The end of the story is that God writes the end of the story. And until then, we are hidden. Both in the sense that our victories are often not visible victories and in the sense that we are hidden in the hands of God, hidden with Christ, safe and secure, even when calamity hits, even when we cry out in lament, even as we wait for the covenant Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. In this hidden place, we delight and enjoy Jesus Christ and fellowship with one another, until we reach the great banquet when we will be fed without scarcity and when our waiting in the night turns to morning, when God will make things right. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Until then, we cry, come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus.